Okay, everyone, I hope you can hear me. My name is Fredrik Svensson. I'm sending to you uh, initiating this webinar from my home studio where I'm located. And that is uh, Karlstad, a small town in the sort of center of Sweden. I hope you're all doing good. Today, we're gonna to talk about the topic, uh, which is building cloud native digital architectures using WSO2 technology. And I will be kicking this off. Uh, I'm representing Red Pelin Pro. I will tell a little bit more about myself shortly, and then I will introduce my colleagues and uh, friends from WSO2 to take this further. So very welcome, all of you. So as mentioned, we will be talking about how to build cloud native digital architectures today using WSO2 technology. Uh, I hope you all can hear me well. Uh, I will start this off with a short introduction of myself, my company, and the topic. I will then hand it over to Shiru and Lakmal from WSO2. And after they've done their keynote, we will open a panel discussion uh, uh, to discuss a few of the topics that has been presented today, and also to let you have an opportunity to ask questions to myself, Shiru, and Lakmal, if you have anything related to, to what has been presented. You can ask your questions uh, if you have any through the Zoom Q&A that you hopefully are, uh, have available in front of you. So my name is Rick Svensson. I have the fancy title of, of CBDO, which stands for Chief Business Development Officer within Red Pill Impro. I am um, with that title, I'm responsible for, for business development, concept sales, and, and, and packaging things together basically through all our customers. I've been working for more than 20 years in the IT industry. Uh, and out of those 20 years, I've been doing 10 years within the API and integration space. I'm also one of the co-writers of the models that we use within Red Pill Impro as, as models on how to implement and deliver API, DevOps, microservices, and digital ready projects. Uh, you can read more about all these uh, through the redpillimpro.com website. And uh, when it comes to WSO2 technology, I have been partner with WSO2 for almost 10 years now. So myself and my company have around 10 years of experience from working with WSO2 technology. As for Red Pill Impro, we, are in, uh, the, we position ourselves or describe ourselves as the leading providers of open source related services and products in Scandinavia. Uh, the company was founded, uh, the Norwegian part in 1995 and the Swedish part in 2003. Last year we had uh, around 400 million Swedish crowns in revenues and we are just about 180 employees today actually. We have offices in various places all over Scandinavia and also a private cloud solution that we deliver from offices in, from our uh, hosting centers in Scandinavia. Uh, what, what we do is that we deliver and package solutions on uh, or around um, important uh, concepts like API and integration, DevOps and cloud. And we call these our solution areas. And for each of these solution areas, we have different models and concepts on things that we believe are important when you implement a new initiative like this. And that's partly related to technology, but it's also partly related to how you organize yourself, how your strategy looks like, and the kind of methodology you choose when you decide to implement, for instance, a new API and integration platform, or if you start working a DevOps way, or if you go from on-prem to cloud solutions. So, Within all these solution areas, we have our own concepts and models, what we think is important. And if we look specifically within the API and integration space, we are partners with several open source, with several of the leading open source based integration and API platforms. We have been gold partners of WSO2 for a while now, and we are around 50 uh, API and integration consultants in the Nordics. And Working with API integration, we have been around for, for a while, starting to work with service-oriented architectures, then moving to API-first uh, initiatives. And nowadays, we talk about concepts like integration as a service. And you can, of course, as I mentioned before, read more about this uh, through the redpillimpro.com website. A few of the organizations we have been working with in Scandinavia related to API and integration are these. Uh, a couple of organizations within public sector, a couple of organizations within transportation and logistics, media, uh, and so forth. So uh, we have, have been around for a while and worked a while with API and integration solutions. Hmm. Enough said about that. Uh, so bringing on the topic of today's webinar, we would 
we'll talk about cloud native digital architectures. And first of all, what is that? What is, what is it? Well, to me, uh, working with cloud native digital architectures means taking full advantage of the distributed, scalable, and flexible nature of cloud infrastructure. And this basically means that as much infrastructure or computing power that you need can be spun up uh, instantly, including databases, operating systems, computing power, or whatever it is. And for a developer, this means that you are abstracting away many layers of infrastructure and allowing them to be defined in code instead, which uh, makes development easier, deployments faster, and eventually going faster from requirement to production, basically. Uh, and this is through making sure that developers can focus on the application itself and the code they develop and not the infrastructure, not having to take care of assigning enough servers or choosing an operating system. They can get access to that instantly through, through a cloud uh, infrastructure. And basically it means being cloud ready from the start. And why is this important then? Well, it removes constraints to shorten path to business value. As I said, it shortens the path from use requirement to actually being able to put that use requirement, requirement into production. Uh, and it allows developers to put the code in front of users much quicker to working in a truly agile way. Uh, basically, it means that if I have an idea about the new feature I would like to introduce, I can introduce that very quickly and easily uh, through my cloud native architecture, not having to go through a complex deploy uh, process. And by doing this, I can put new features in front of users and collect the feedback uh, to further improve the application directly together with the users, uh, not, go ha not having to take care of infrastructure that would be required, doing it the old way, basically. And also, it means that you're able to treat infrastructure as an API, basically. You can also test various infrastructures, the databases or whatever, in your development process. Uh, you don't, and, and if it doesn't work, you can just revert and try another database or another operating system instead, which makes the whole development phase much quicker and easier. Uh, and basically, this means shortening release, test, and development cycles, in many cases, from months to weeks or even days. We have customers that do five to seven deploys a day uh, on their uh, on their cloud native rigs. So, so basically that's the kind of involvement we're talking about here. And from a business perspective, uh, it means you are able to foster introduce and create business value and making apps truly an integral part of your business development. It, you can even be sitting at a, at a morning meeting, talking to a developer about things you would like to add. You can have that developer working on them during the day, and then po potentially deploy them the next day or even in the evening. So that's sort of the kind of development cycles we're talking about. And taking this a step further, what are the enablers and pitfalls then? Well, a cloud native architecture brings, of course, great promises. Um, then why is not everyone doing this already? Uh, well, you need to introduce maybe new tooling, concepts, and supporting technology. So you need to sort of move away from how you used to treat infrastructure to the cloud-based way of doing things. Uh, there are a couple of pitfalls to avoid, and, and you need to, to assure uh, uh, processes and, and methods in place to avoid them. We will address a few of them today. Um, we will also talk a little bit about introduction of a cloud-native reference architecture. Um, and implement different way of, of, of how to implement uh, or different options when it comes to implementing a cloud native architecture. These are the few of the topics that I think my colleague or and, and friend at WC2, Shiro Shika, will cover in your presentation. So with this introduction, Shiro, I'm handing things over to you and uh, letting you take uh, responsibility from now on. Okay, thanks, Frederick. Uh, so a quick intro to myself. I'm Shiro. Um, I'm a solutions architect uh, at WSO2. Uh, I'm um, based in Colombo, Sri Lanka, and I mainly work with customers in uh, the European region. Uh, so uh, together with me, uh, uh, Lakmar, Hasini, and Ramal will also be joining from WSO2, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you, 
Thanks, Cheryl. Um, hi, guys. Uh, this is Hasini, and I'm an account manager um, for the European region. I've uh, been with the company for uh, roughly four years now, and um, yeah, uh, we're me and Rama are here in case you have any questions related to uh, the commercial aspects or anything you want to know about WSO2. Um, just reach out through the Q and A section, and we are here to help you out. Uh, Rama, you want to take over? Yeah. Um, hi guys, my name is Ramal and I have been working on the Europe team for more than uh, two and a half years. So like Hassani mentioned, if you guys have any technical questions, uh, any, any commercial related questions, feel free to drop it on the chat as well. And also you can reach us through LinkedIn as well. So that's it from me. Uh, over to you, Lakmal. Thanks, Samal. Hi, uh, I'm Lakmal. Uh, I'm working as a solution architect. Uh, and also the, my interest area is uh, more into cloud native uh, uh, domain. Uh, I'm in the California, so it's early morning, it's 5 a.m. Yeah, order you, Shiro. Okay, thanks. Right. So um, let's then start off with uh, the main session of the uh, workshop. So it's about building cloud native digital architectures with WSO te technology. So um, Lakmal and myself will be presenting this session. So uh, what we'll cover is we'll first go through a couple of concepts uh, that are uh, uh, relevant in this area. And then we'll introduce a reference architecture for uh, cloud native digital uh, architecture for an enterprise. And then we'll um, look at a reference implementation. So uh, before we go any further, uh, let's uh, look at what cloud native is. So when, when you say cloud native, different things come to uh, uh, mind of different people. So some people, the moment they hear cloud native, uh, what they think is containers. Uh, for some people, it's microservices. Uh, and then uh, for some people, uh, it's more of scalability and using the cloud. Uh, but if you look at the definition of cloud nativeness, uh, it's basically a combination. It's a philosophical approach and a set of technologies. So these things together that allow organizations, uh, enable organizations to build uh, software applications, deploy these applications, and then operate these op uh, applications in a frequent, resilient, and reliable manner. So uh, now, when I told that uh, about the things that comes to people's minds, uh, most of those things were the technical side of things, like the containers, the uh, cloud itself, uh, scaling, and so on. But a very important part of this um, that needs to be taken into consideration is the culture of an organization. So it's most of the time ignored and uh, not really given prominence. And that itself sometimes leads to failure when some organizations uh, try to start going towards a more cloud native uh, oriented architecture for the organization. So what do we mean by this culture? Now, if it's cloud native, then uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, principles that these applications need to uh, adhere to. So uh, what we mean from a culture point of view is having autonomous and small teams or the correct size teams that can own the moving parts of this architecture, then releases that are frequent. Uh, and uh, practices which are automated. So these are some of these cultural aspects that need to be uh, considered. Because if you, if you set up a cloud native architecture with all the technologies in place, but if your practices and processes are not uh, in line, then uh, that's not going to work. So you need these, uh, the culture change also to happen if you want to succeed, okay. So having said that, then let's look at the cloud native landscape. So 
this is the technology landscape for cloud native. So there is a foundation for cloud native uh, computing foundation. And this essentially is a, it's a ecosystem uh, that uh, is it's made for fostering the community and uh, enabling growth in, in open source cloud native tools. So uh, uh, if you look at the variety of tools that are there, the technologies that are there, they can be broken down uh, uh, in this particular manner of stack that I have in this slide, uh, starting at the infrastructure level, then the tools that are required for provisioning of the uh, host, uh, hosts and the containers themselves, then the run times, uh, the interfaces that are needed for the runtime so th that you make sure that the implementations always uh, follow that same standard. Then the orchestration tools that are needed like uh, Kubernetes and so on. And then finally the application uh, definition uh, tools that are used. So if you put this into a single picture or try to put this into a single picture, what you see is something very complicated like this. Now, um, uh, if you if you are an organization and if you are trying to basically come up with a cloud native architecture for your organization, uh, you will then need your developers, your uh, DevOps engineers uh, to understand all of these tools or most of these tools and pick what is needed in order to do that. So that is what we are trying to do here. Uh, and we are trying to make this complexity a bit less uh, by uh, essentially uh, coming up with a reference architecture and then uh, recommending some of these tools which can be used in that uh, reference implementation. And then also um, as vendors coming up with platforms that hide some of the complexity and give an abstraction that could be easily used. Okay, so let's move on to uh, then the, uh, the actual cloud native digital architecture of an organization. And again, before we go into that architecture, let's take a look at some of the concepts behind this. So um, today's era of an organization is moving towards digital transformation. It has been that for the past few years now. And um, what are organizations looking at? Uh, they want to basically uh, come up with new services, new applications, they are looking for fast innovation, uh, which is done through effective collaboration so that they can deliver more value to their customers, but with less effort. If, if you have to basically put a lot of effort to do this, uh, make use of a lot of resources, then invariably you're not going to be able to uh, do this innovation in a fast manner. That means you're going to basically lose uh, when you put yourself against the competitors in your industry. So uh, what, we are, what organizations really look for is a way to do this with less effort. So cloud native basically does frequent releases. And that means it requires an organization to do uh, agile requirement gathering then being able to design an uh, design uh, uh, these uh, new capabilities, do architecture reviews quickly, develop these test and deployment. And then the tooling basically side of things will help you in the development, testing and deployment in a seamless manner. Now, uh, so digital transformation requires business services to be easily consumable as well. And that's where APIs comes into the picture. But now if you take a, a organization, uh, an organization behind the scenes to provide the business capabilities would require to talk to multiple services, different endpoints, some of these legacy data in the cloud, et cetera. And all of this cannot be done by just a single API. So behind that single API facade, there might be a comp position that happens, which is the integration side of things. So essentially, API-led integration completes this need of uh, digital transformation. So the combination 
of cloud native technologies together with API led integration platform creates an effective architecture for a cloud native digital enterprise. So some of the uh, properties uh, that are required in uh, the applications that will be uh, uh, will be using this cloud native digital architecture is that these so there will be several moving parts. Uh, each of these moving parts would should be lightweight because they are they should be able to easily start up. They should be uh, uh, components which do not eat up a lot of resources. They can they should be able to scale easily. Uh, then uh, they shouldn't have to uh, depend on program logic uh, to figure out what needs to be done in an environment. This needs to come from a config file based on the environments and which can easily adapt. Um, then the uh, the uh, these components need to be immutable because uh, uh, it, you can't go to that era where the developer says it works on my machine, but the QA or the, the, the staging testing environment says it's not working. So if, if you need to come up, uh, use a technology so that it works in any environment. And then finally, you have a lot of moving parts. And in order to see what is happening and to get some insight from uh, all of these components, you need observability. And for observability, each one of these components need to push out metrics uh, so that they can basically be, uh, all of these metrics can be put together and then uh, come up with a unified view. So cloud native technologies, um, so all of, these, uh, all of these capabilities basically point to a particular thing saying that each of, of these components need to be uh, similar to microservices and cloud native technologies such as containers and the orchestration platforms are, are critically uh, required for successful microservices based application development. Now, so having uh, uh, given a quick view of the different concepts that uh, come in uh, cloud native digital uh, enterprise, then uh, so what we would like to next present is the reference architecture for a cloud native digital enterprise. So what you see here is um, you have the users at the very top. Uh, so they come through different digital channels and they consume different digital products. Uh, they come from various uh, modes. And then uh, this overall architecture uh, is broken down into a control uh, plane and then a data plane. Then the control, so in the control plane, you have the components that are used for governance, and defining and so on. And then the, the, the run times basically decide in the uh, data plane. And you also see the infrastructure side of things uh, at the bottom of this diagram. So this basically shows that the infrastructure can come from uh, various sources and they basically will be abstracted using contain orchestration platforms or systems that provide function as a service. And then we have another cross-cutting uh, concern, which is the observability uh, that will basically provide the business insight reports uh, of this overall system. So these are the main uh, uh, parts of this reference architecture. So we'll go uh, in, we'll visit a couple of these uh, points in a bit, bit more detail in the following slides. So the control plane, uh, it, that's the central location where the different policies for these services are defined. So these can be uh, usage policies like uh, throttling and so on. And these can also be security policies to figure out like which services should be uh, accessed by who and so on. Uh, then we have the API gateways. So which are the policy enforcement points? So the, the control plan is where the policies are defined and the gateways are where 
these policies are enforced. Um, and the API gateways basically fall into the data plane because the gateway is a runtime component. Then the data plane is segregated into two parts. So we have the base services, that's the base microservices, and then the integration services. So it's very rarely that you would uh, have a business functionality mapping directly to a base microservice. The uh, a business functionality will need to map be mapped into a composition of many of these microservices, base microservices, and some external endpoints put together uh, with integration logic. So, so the data plane has uh, both of these types of services uh, included. Then uh, from a usage point of view, uh, this architecture requires a self-service developer portal because you create these APIs and then they need to be consumed. So where you can basically find these APIs is, is the developer portal. Uh, and this essentially is an important part in this API ecosystem. And this broadens out into an API marketplace. So an API marketplace basically uh, enables multiple parties to put their different services uh, APIs there so that they can be used uh, by both internal and external people. Then the obs observability part comes into play where the dashboards and reports help uh, so consume the different metrics that are pushed by the services, pushed by the orchestration systems and so on. And gives a business and operational 360 view of this overall digital business. So all of these components together uh, basically uh, are required to build this cloud native digital enterprise. Okay, now, so that was the base reference architecture. Now, so we, we basically spoke a lot about API led integration uh, and uh, the, the, the run times from a containerized point of view. But there are a few more things that needs to come into the picture when you're talking about cloud native digital architectures. So this is where we bring in the nose of an enterprise IPaaS. So it's a combination of the cloud centric integration technologies with the API management capabilities. So this essentially brings together a platform which is known as an enterprise IPaaS. And this uh, adds, to, adds to the synergy that was created uh, uh, in the earlier reference architecture by providing the agility, the flexibility and scalability, uh, which comes under the hood through the automation. So uh, what we have seen is today, uh, technical leadership in organizations prefer to adopt an enterprise EI pass rather than just a pass uh, or build something with the basic components that are needed because it gives a, a single like stop solution for this or for all the needs that are there. So uh, these are, so this picture shows you some of the components that uh, go into a cloud native enterprise uh, IPaaS. Now, we have some of the components that were defined in the previous reference architecture, like the API management part, the integration part. But here we have um, we have uh, expanded it a bit more, showing that there can be different types of gateways to uh, to address the different type of integrations that are needed uh, in an organization in a digital sense, and then. Um, we also have brought in some new components into that uh, uh, the previous list of components. So uh, again, of course, we have the control plane and the data plane and the control plane has uh, basically consists of the diff different portals that are used for the policy definition. So in addition to just policy definition, you also do configuration definition and even integration logic. So, uh, we'll talk about the uh, integration logic in a little while. And then the data plane where uh, the, these are enforced and where the actual uh, runtimes will reside. 
then of course the same uh, components of api management uh, observability and security comes into the picture uh, the security provides basically the policies that are uh, security policies for apis uh, it manages tokens and protects the apis so this is where the integration component comes in so now we mentioned that um, behind that api you need integration and this component in this enterprise ei pass basically gives you the tooling for either low code or no code uh, creation of integration so with uh, so here in either one of these you have a template and you basically can uh, start off with a template and create that integration that you need so if it is no code you have already pre-built integrations for different systems maybe connecting uh, sap and salesforce for a particular scenario uh, or if it is low code you have bits of templates that could be developed a bit more so you can drag and drop the components and then you can develop on top of it so both of these options basically uh, minimizes that technical gap which is required in the integration space and by doing that it increases the productivity because it reduces time for go to market then we also need the continuous ci cd uh, part of things to ensure fast rollout of services uh, so so this is where uh, the 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 automation uh, the ops part of things come into play so bringing these components into that previous uh, view of the uh, reference architecture we now have the enterprise ipas data plane uh, which basically takes into account uh, of uh, and the control plane which takes into account of those additional components which lie together with the uh, other components that were defined earlier so um, now one point is that organizations if if everything all the application and all the data reside in a single cloud provider then of course uh, uh, it it's it can increase productivity when uh, all of them are in the same place but however this is not the case in most of the situation uh, cases so uh, the, you basically will have situations where organizations have data regulations um they need to comply to certain data regulations or they are they are the systems are mostly legacy and they can't really move these to the cloud so some of the integration and enforcement actually needs to happen on prem uh, then there are certain organizations which are still at the very initial uh, stage of uh, digital transformation where they their initial systems are on-prem and they're in the process of moving to the cloud so for either one of these situations a hybrid enterprise ei pass basically provides the uh, uh, provides the solution of, for these requirements so what a hybrid um, enterprise ei pass is is where the data plane components can run off the cloud so they can run on-prem and this basically reduces the tight coupling that the data plane had in the control plane. So now we basically come to a variation of the reference architecture diagram where part of this uh, data plane is running on-prem, whereas part uh, of this may be on the cloud. So these might be the newer components where you can create on the cloud itself, where they connect to uh, just cloud endpoints uh, and so on but you also have some of these data plate components which are on-prem so here the connectivity to the uh, to the control plane is not as tight as the previous occasion and uh, the so if it is on the cloud the previous uh, dimension cloud con uh, contain orchestration platforms or function as a service systems will be there but if it is on-prem, then it can even be on bare metal VM. So it can, some of these components can actually run on VMs. But again, if you want to gain the advantages of uh, cloud nativeness, then basically uh, 
it would be good to uh, so you can still maintain this on prem but on your private data center try to basically have a contain orchestration system like kubernetes uh, for those services so uh, the policies so in a hybrid system the policies are still defined in that control plane and the 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 execution part of this will be abstracted out with the run times but um, the observability matrix so initially uh, when it was uh, fully on the cloud uh, with the tight uh, with the full coupling with the control plane the observability matrix were uh, synced uh, directly with the control plane in a hybrid situation uh, it would first be captured locally and then synced periodically with the control plane but still the 360 degree views of both business and operation can be viewed now uh, so we basically then come to a place uh, another variation of this reference architecture uh, which where we basically look at service meshes now when you're decomposing a monolith and you're basically moving to a microservices oriented architecture you need to think about the fallacies of distributed computing. So like there are network issues, there could be bandwidth issues, uh, there could be security issues and so on. Now, uh, the monolith basically handled all of this in a single place. But when you start decomposing the monolith, then you come to a place that do each and every of these services also have to consider this but that's going to be too complex and too tedious so what we basically have seen is from a tooling uh, technology point of view is that a service mesh can basically address these problems by deploying a sidecar alongside each microservice so that this sidecar intercepts any uh, interaction that comes from the network layer so all those uh, external uh, things other than the business functionality that the service is handling will be basically handled at the sidecar proxy. So all, uh, all uh, service to service interactions will happen uh, first via these sidecar proxies. Then if there are uh, external invocations, those will come through another gateway into one of these sidecar proxies and then into the service. But the, the different policies and so on, uh, the different uh, security capabilities and so on will be handled at the sidecar. So this all the complex operational requirements will basically be handled at the sidecar. So if you have many services, which would be the case, then this sidecar mesh network will basically look like this. So none of these services are directly talking to each other. It's always communication through the sidecars. So this variation can also be brought into this reference architecture. And here we basically see that there's uh, the, the data plane basically now has uh, a small components which comprise of a, of a proxy, the sidecar, and then the service. And then uh, interaction happens only through the uh, sidecar. So there are different ways of, uh, there are different directions of uh, interactions here. So we have the north to south and then the east to west, uh, basically depicting uh, different things. So. Uh, east to west would be service to service and these are handled by the proxies or the sidecars. North to south are basically the API invocations, the business invocations that are handled by the ingress gateways that you see here. Now, if you look at this diagram, we also have an ingress gateway here. So this basically is when you, you want to basically apply some of these policies uh, even for the service to service, uh, east to west communication. So then basically that sidecar becomes an enforcement point for some of those application policies that were created at the control plane. So we have different types of gateways now in this reference architecture and uh, eventually they all seem to converge to a single place. So that organization can 
opt for having an all-in-one gateway or still decide to have these separated out so that each concern, because each one of these addresses a different concern, uh, could be uh, basically uh, uh, if, if there is a if there is a scaling need for just the API gateways, then they could be scaled out separately, whereas the others don't need to and so on. Okay, so the final point that comes in uh, to this from the uh, uh, for, for this overall reference architecture uh, is basically the delivery pipeline and the main thing that is needed there is automation so cloud nativeness is about fast innovation with continuous feedback so you basically get frequent feedback and you want to deliver an improved product so it could be daily or it could be even be hourly now uh, Continuous integration and continuous deployment is absolutely critical for achieving that level of agility. You can't have manual processes there. So GitOps is basically a way of implementing this uh, into a cloud uh, native architecture. So it basically uses the concepts of Git, the source repository system, and then the operations part of DevOps and puts these together to bring in what is needed into a cloud native architecture. So in this uh, CI CD automation with GitOps, basically there are a few concepts. So each one of those moving parts, which were the microservices, will essentially have a repository. Uh, now they would have an application repository and a deployment repository, because we said that each one of these uh, applications are immutable. So the application code and all of that goes into the application repository, then any configuration and any things that needs to be applied to different environments and so on goes in as infrastructure code into the deployment repository. So the API developer or the service developer creates that uh, component, pushes it into the repository. And this is based on the Git system. So you would have Git hooks that would basically be programmed to trigger. And the build pipeline basically starts to work. And then the containers, the, the actual uh, executables that comes out from this system uh, goes into the uh, container registry. And this also basically updates the uh, deployment part of things in the deployment repository then each one of these repositories will have multiple branches which depicts the different environments. So here we have dev, staging, and production. And whenever a new uh, uh, a pull request is basically merged into one of these branches, this triggers the deployment pipeline. And this will basically take in the necessary components, put them together and do the deployment into one of these environments based on where each one of these, uh, uh, where the trigger happened. So if you want to roll back, then again, what needs to be done is put another pull request, which would depict uh, the changes that needs to uh, happen in order to get the system to the previous state. And this uh, uh, pipe, this, this set of pipelines basically will uh, the set of triggers will basically uh, trigger off the pipeline and do the necessary changes quickly. So this sort of automation is an absolute must when you are thinking about uh, cloud native architectures. Okay, so that brings us to the uh, end of the uh, reference architecture uh, part and next we will now look at an implementation of the reference architecture. So I'll be handing over this uh, to Lakmar. Thanks, Hill. Let me share my screen. Hope you can see my screen now. see okay cool right uh yeah so like uh, shiro uh, mentioned so uh, we 
uh, we define a reference uh, architecture now. Now let's see how we can uh, uh, we can choose the correct uh, uh, cloud native landscape technology stack to uh, implement uh, this reference architecture. So this is uh, this is a reference reference implementation of uh, cloud native digital enterprise on using uh, Kubernetes uh, as a container orchestration platform. Uh, so, so we can install, uh, configure Kubernetes uh, platform on top of either private or public cloud, or we can have a hybrid mode. Uh, we can uh, run uh, Kubernetes clusters across the uh, different, uh, uh, different cloud providers, or we can run on like uh, cloud and on-prem version as well. So that gives a platform uh, to implement uh, this architecture. So when you come to the Kubernetes, uh, so I think many of us think uh, Kubernetes as a platform, but in my opinion, uh, Kubernetes is a platform to build platform. So the, the, the concept and the architectural extension points that provide from the Kubernetes can easily use and extend to create another platform. So in this case, uh, so we use this Kubernetes uh, uh, platform concept and the extension point to build uh, digital enterprise uh, as another platform. Uh, yeah, so like uh, uh, Shiro mentioned, so mainly we, we do have control plane and data plane. So the control plane components uh, uh, that mainly uh, like uh, how you can define the life cycle of API and how you can do uh, provide the different uh, portals or different personas and then how you can uh, observe and generate a report uh, out of this uh, data we collect from the data pane. So, uh, and for WSO2 API manager, uh, like uh, components, key manager, uh, traffic manager, publishers are residing in the control and management plane. And we have made two uh, 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 portals that for a marketplace, we need to expose, uh, we need to make available these APIs to uh, discover from the outside uh, partners or consumers. They, they, that's where the API developer portal uh, uh, coming to the picture. Uh, so uh, that is a self-service uh, portal. And also uh, uh, for the, the uh, get the business insight, as well as the operational uh, insights. So we need to collect data uh, uh, from the data plane, and then we need to do some analysis and uh, generate reports. So when you come to the data plane, so mainly the data plane, uh, that policy enforcement component like uh, API gateways and uh, indication uh, gateways are reside in the data plane. Uh, so now, here, so we are, we are uh, talking about how we can use Kubernetes uh, platform features. So when when you deploy uh, uh, even gateway, that can be a micro gateway, that can be integration gateway. So this component also can scale independently. So that's that's what we're looking uh, by using a cloud native platform. So when you deploy uh, even a micro gateway, so that micro gateway uh, in the in the Kubernetes term, we need to have uh, we need to have Kubernetes deployment, and we need to have a HPA, horizontal port auto scaler. That's where we monitor this uh, uh, gateway runtime and scale automatically depending on the, the auto scaling factors we define. Uh, and also, we need to protect our data, uh, like uh, we need to protect certificates. So that's where the secret uh, Kubernetes secrets object coming to the victim. And each of this runtime has some configuration. So that's where the Kubernetes config map coming to the picture. So there are a lot of uh, uh, concepts that we have to use that coming uh, from the Kubernetes platform when, when you de deploy uh, these thing into the Kubernetes. Uh, so if you look at, the, these are some of the challenges uh, also uh, like uh, uh, to customers or people to move into the cloud native platform. So there are a lot of learning curve uh, to adapt this kind of uh, uh, platform so uh, to as a solution to, to this problem uh, like we we have introduced uh, this uh, wso2 kubernetes api operator uh, so 
uh, I will explain further detail uh, what uh, API operator brings into the picture. Uh, so that uh, component uh, will help to automate all this deployment uh, that we require to deploy in Kubernetes. Just getting a Saga file for as an API developer, just passing Saga file, it will generate all this component uh, automatically uh, into the Kubernetes platform. So uh, if you look at, uh, so when you when you uh, install WC API manager component uh, with this uh, Kubernetes platform, we can build uh, uh, full-fledged uh, digital enterprise that has all the automation requirement to, uh, to uh, have a successful digital uh, uh, ecosystem. Yeah, so like uh, Shiro mentioned, so uh, so when you come to the the conceptually, the gateways are can be into the merge into single uh, uh, component. Even if you if you are starting from a simple deployment, yes, we can use a, a, a all in one gateway uh, to uh, several things. But when you come to the the scalability uh, aspect, so every business want to scale, right? So then we need to think about how we can have a, a scale out uh, this uh, component to get a uh, higher uh, traffic volume. So uh, this is where we can have uh, this kind of uh, scale, scalable architecture. So this has the normal uh, API facade uh, pattern as well. So API gateway can be scaled independently. And also uh, API gateway can communicate with the micro gateway, uh, micro uh, integration. Uh, so that can do the integration with the uh, other component and the legacy system. There can be uh, streaming integration. So that, <coughs> sorry, for that we can use uh, streaming integration. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, uh, when you come to the deployment aspect, aspect. So uh, you know that. Uh, the, when you come to the cloud uh, native deployment, so deployment can be uh, have a different uh, patterns. Uh, so even when we're talking talking uh, talk about the API gateways, also we have identified different deployment patterns. Uh, so uh, so we mainly identified three patterns uh, here. So if you look at the left uh, leftmost side, like uh, there's a shared gateway pattern. So in this pattern, uh, our micro gateway layer can be uh, 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 grouped into single uh, gateway. So that gateway layer can be scaled uh, horizontally. And all the other uh, uh, services will connect to this uh, single uh, shared gateway cluster and do the API, enforce, uh, API policy enf enforcement. So that is like a, a normal conventional way of uh, we 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 use the regular gateway in the monolithic ar architecture. Uh, so uh, to uh, like adapt uh, cloud native architecture, sometimes we need to start from uh, the whatever existing patterns. Then we uh, move into the different patterns uh, with the different uh, uh, scaling expectations. And then the, the in the middle uh, there's another pattern called private jet gateway. So, uh, so if you look at microservice architecture, so we uh, decompose uh, uh, the monolith into the smaller services mainly because we need to have a, need to want to have a scalability. The same concept applied to the gateway layer. So gateway layers can be scaled independently, and also, uh, uh, so Shura mentioned that there's an autonomy uh, required for uh, to do a microservice uh, best practices. So, uh, so uh, when you when you have the autonomous autonomous team, so they can start with the developing services. Now, after that, if they want to uh, wait for a API uh, uh, or uh, enterprise integration team to uh, uh, put the API gateways uh, or update the API gateways to uh, expose their uh, the newly created services as a business function uh, uh, into the production. So, so that. Uh, that will give, uh, that will not give the the expectation of moving to the cloud. So here, uh, if you have, we can we can have a separate 
gateway groups. So even uh, this particular gateway group can be owned by the this same autonomous team. So when they ready with their services, backend services, they can use their uh, 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 gateway uh, and update the gateway and expose their business services. So it will give the the autonomous autonomy for for from the development to put their uh, business function into the production by having this kind of a uh, grouping. So that uh, the, the private uh, jet gateway is very uh, uh, nicely fitting. So uh, then uh, these different uh, uh, gateway groups can in, uh, uh, operate differently uh, and they can scale uh, uh, differently uh, without impact into other business units. So sometimes, so like uh, Shiro discussed with the service mesh architecture. So, uh, so with this uh, service mesh uh, uh, patterns like the sidecar, uh, uh, intercept all the traffic, uh, and then how to do the uh, different policy enforcement. So in that in that kind of pattern, we can use uh, if a gateway has a sidecar component to the service. So the main difference between the private jet and the uh, sidecar mode when you scale a service that is scale with the gateway itself so it's two components uh, is that the two component but when you're scaling out so both component will be scaled out uh, so it's a, again uh, can we can use a different uh, scenario so uh, if if you know that the, these uh, components are not scaling independently we can make it a single uh, component uh, like a sidecar and uh, to the deployment so uh, there's no exact way to use uh, uh, this pattern. So depending on the, your business requirement and the scaling requirement, uh, we can think of using uh, one of these patterns. Okay, so let's look at, uh, so uh, this uh, running a different uh, group of micro, uh, micro gateway clusters in your architecture. Uh, so uh, normally uh, I think we all familiar with having a central uh, centralized gateway uh, cluster uh, to do the policy enforcement or uh, enforce some governance policies. Now, uh, like I said, uh, with the microservice architecture, with the scalable architecture, we, we can have a, a separate API gateway groups, uh, clusters uh, uh, to uh, enforce these policies. Now, uh, so this uh, gateway clusters can be uh, exposed as, a, as it is as a separate URLs. So sometimes, for example, if, if, you, if you have a, a, a separate department and they want to expose a, a different uh, department uh, URLs, for example, it can be an engineering department so that they can expose as the engineering, uh, that URL can be uh, in the engineering uh, 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 subdomain. And they can expose this as uh, APIs as an engineering uh, subdomain included in the URL. So then we can have these separate micro gateway clusters, and we can expose them as a, uh, in the Kubernetes term, we can expose them as a load balancer type. So they, they will give a different load balancer uh, URL uh, to interact uh, uh, for the their clients. Uh, and so this uh, sometimes uh, this uh, micro gateway cluster can be internal gateway. So for example, internal uh, development team can use uh, different URL to interact with uh, these APIs. Uh, now, when you come to the, if, if uh, for example, some, some, of our, some of our customers want to expose all these APIs as a single URL, this is where this ingress gateway uh, coming into the picture. So there's no uh, changes in the uh, grouping, but when you want to expose all the gateway clusters as a single URL, uh, uh, we can automate by uh, defining ingress rules and publish uh, into a single URL and expose it to the, uh, uh, our clients or consumers uh, that uh, consuming. So again, uh, the uh, API WC2 uh, uh, Kubernetes API operator is fully uh, capable of automating all the ingress uh, uh, rule publication. So whenever we configure the ingress gateway, it automatically add a rule when we deploy a uh, micro gateway cluster. So uh, uh, 
so uh, so you know, we discuss now the, the generic kubernetes uh, how we can deploy a generic uh, api uh, gateways uh, and api management component in generic kubernetes cluster now uh, so like siro mentioned the there are different uh, cloud into platform in this industry now so the service mesh is another uh, platform that try to uh, solve uh, different challenges uh, that coming from the microservice architecture uh, the service service communication uh, and how uh, resiliency how to make resiliency uh, secure communication these are the, the main goal of uh, having the service mesh so uh, but service mesh doesn't solve the api management problem so this is where again uh, the api management provider coming into the picture and here uh, uh, we we do have native integration with the uh, service meshes like istio so our kubernetes api operator is natively integrated with istio uh, so if if you if you take the istio uh, service mesh again it's built on top of kubernetes that's why i i, I told that the kubernetes is a built platform on top of uh, kubernetes so it's a platform of platform so uh, so we can use the same uh, kubernetes api uh, to automate uh, things uh, in the uh, istio uh, service mesh uh, uh, deployment so this is uh, uh, there are few patterns uh, as well uh, in the service mesh uh, 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 in, in uh, api management on service mesh uh, so this is the uh, we call it uh, uh, mutual ssl mode so here uh, service to service communication will happen via the uh, service proxy uh, in this case on no via the on no proxy and uh, so there's a ingress gateway uh, so ingress gateway is managing how uh, we can do the uh, different traffic partitions for example if you want to uh, introduce a new version of a particular service we can say 90% uh, of the uh, traffic should be go to the new version or uh, old version and 10% of traffic goes to the new version or if you want to do the ab testing uh, we can say uh, this, this set of uh, features uh, uh, can be go to the new version or uh, all other traffic go to the older version so we can try out different uh, uh, deployment strategies by using this ingress gateway uh, but now, uh, uh, from the business point of view, uh, when you want to expose this uh, business functionality as an API, then we need to have an API gateway uh, component. Uh, this is where the WS2 API micro gateway uh, comes into the picture. So micro gateway can deploy in front of the uh, STO gateway uh, and provide the, all the API uh, management capabilities. So in, the, in this pattern, uh, the, from the scalability point of view, micro gateway cluster scale uh, independently and then the service will handle uh, independently using the uh, ingress gateway uh, so uh, so this is a common pattern that we can see uh, how you can enforce the api management on top of uh, uh, istio uh, service mesh uh, this is another pattern like uh, so we can deploy uh, a micro api gateway as a, again service uh, in the service mesh uh, uh, this give the the scalability uh, uh, within the cluster but there are some limitation in this pattern uh, for example uh, if you use this pattern uh, you can't uh, do the uh, the traffic routing policies that i previously uh, mentioned that uh, you can't uh, say the new version i want to uh, route the traffic for the new version uh, while having the older version so this this things can't uh, handle uh, in this pattern for some cases uh, yes, uh, we can use this pattern uh, uh, to enforce uh, some uh, api management within the service mesh cluster the, uh, the generic pattern was the previous uh, mutual ssl mode uh, that will uh, there's no limitation uh, it can uh, handle all the service mesh capabilities within the uh, service mesh cluster okay so uh, so let's come to the uh, uh, the this kubernetes operator pattern so uh, we all know that kubernetes is for the automation right uh, so uh, if you take the kubernetes platform there there are things we can do out of the box 
for sometimes like i said when you want to build another platform on top of kubernetes we need to extend the kubernetes uh, uh, capability this is where this operator pattern uh, coming to the picture uh, so we use the same uh, extension uh, uh, capabilities and we build a uh, api operator uh, to uh, have the fully automated experience to developer uh, who are looking for api management on top of uh, kubernetes so this is the uh, the component of the api operator so when uh, so we we have introduced few uh, custom resource definition uh, uh, on top of the kubernetes uh, for these uh, capabilities so we have introduced uh, api uh, custom resource target endpoint custom resource security custom resource and rate limiting custom resource so so uh, like you see so this custom resource are in the domain of api operator uh, api uh, developer so we api developer know say what is api api developer know what is target endpoint uh, api developer know what is security and rate limited so what we have what we have try to do here like uh, we abstract out the, uh, the the complexity that providing in, uh, providing by the kubernetes but we give the the abstraction that can understand from the api developer so they can interact with this abstraction uh, but uh, for example if a uh, developer want to uh, de uh, deploy your api so they can use the sega file and pass it into the, uh, the this kubernetes api server then api server will uh, with this uh, new re resource definition extract that whatever the sega file uh, having that uh, what is the target endpoint one what is the security protocol uh, uh, security we want to implement and what is the rate limiting and then api controller will create the necessary artifacts uh, that required to deploy in the kubernetes for example it will automatically generate a, a docker image and push into the registry and also it will create the kubernetes deployment artifacts service artifacts hpa for auto scaling artif uh, uh, artifacts and then do the deployment into the kubernetes cluster so if you look at so we try to minimize the complexity uh, by uh, introducing new abstraction that uh, in the api and integration domain and then the api developers or integration developers can easily interact with uh, this platform to uh, automate the deployment and get the benefit out of this cloud native platform okay so the, the then the, the observability so uh, like uh, shiro mentioned so when when you have a, a large number of components so a lot of moving parts now uh, now we need to observe each and every uh, moving uh, component and otherwise we can't uh, 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 you can't have the uh, 360 view what happening in this system uh, so uh, for the earlier i think if you are using wso2 uh, platform in a monolithic architectures so uh, we used to have a log uh, uh, logging uh, uh, log, logging system and uh, using that log uh, aggregators we 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 do different things for example uh, if you want to have a correlation id so normally we uh, log uh, a particular correlation id per particular request and then we use a different uh, uh, analytics uh, tools to visualize what happening uh, in the system uh, we can do the same thing in the uh, cloud native uh, platform but uh, the thing is uh, so since now we having a lot of moving parts uh, we have to use the cloud native technologies to do that even though we can use the log based uh, analytics tools but we recommend to use like uh, uh, different uh, uh, tech, uh, technologies for example we can use open tracing uh, and uh, uh, wso gateways support open tracing out of the box so and we we already have the prometheus metrics uh, uh, publishing uh, from the gateway component so we can use uh, prometheus or jiga uh, uh, or fluentd uh, to aggregate uh, all this data that pu published from the gateway and visualize easily visualize uh, what what is happening on the, inside the, our scalable uh, clusters so this is how we can do cloud natively uh, uh, observability uh, uh, otherwise it is very hard to manage uh, when you have a, a large scale deployment uh, yeah so uh, not only the uh, 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 scale uh, observability we can use this uh, uh, captured metrics to uh, define a custom uh, auto scaling 
for example uh, we can use this prometheus uh, uh, metrics and uh, fed into the uh, horizontal pot auto scaler uh, for example we can we can count uh, we can get the api request count for a particular gateway and uh, we can have a custom uh, auto scaling policies if the api request count is going more than whatever x number we can scale up the backend service uh, uh, before it's hitting the uh, threshold so we can do a lot of things uh, if, if you have these cloud native architectures uh, in your place so finally uh, uh, like shiro mentioned yes the automation is critical to have a continuous uh, delivery uh, so th uh, the cloud is about how you can uh, uh, deploy fa fa fast and get the early feedback so otherwise uh, this is how uh, uh, the all the uh, the major cloud providers become success so they get early feedback and uh, if there are issue uh, they fix and they are and deploy within the a couple of hours or some cloud providers deploy within a couple of minutes so to to have that we need to have a fully made, a fully automated system this is where gitops based automation is required uh, yeah so uh, so this is how we can map uh, wso technology uh, into this gitops automation uh, so we can start with either uh, uh, sago or the code then uh, we can come into the application regis uh, repository then uh, application uh, the, the build pipeline can create the uh, docker images or uh, container images and push into the registry container registry now uh, like 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 i said so uh, like uh, shiro said the the immutable nature of uh, 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 is very important when you when you having a docker based deployment so when you Create a Docker registry. So uh, when you create a Docker image and push in the registry, so same uh, Docker image can be used in the different uh, staging uh, environment. Uh, and only the configuration or the, the other configuration can be changed. That's where the deployment artifact repository uh, uh, coming to the picture. Then we can trigger a deployment pipeline and deploy uh, all this component into the uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster. So we can have a number of uh, environment here. So depending on your uh, uh, practices, uh, we can configure uh, these uh, GitOps uh, to work with uh, uh, different uh, environment. Yeah, I think uh, that's the, uh, how we can implement uh, these reference architectures uh, using WSO2 component and the uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, platform. Uh, so we, we do have, uh, uh, the white papers to cover like uh, how you can uh, what's the reference architecture uh, digital uh, reference architect digital enterprise and how we can implement uh, this uh, reference architecture by using uh, wsc2 technology and also uh, so this is also important so shira has mentioned that the the i think the culture uh, the important of the important of the culture aspect so uh, we know that we we, we are working more uh, many customers more than uh, 500 600 customers sometimes we 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 are seeing that some of customers fail in this journey uh, mainly because they they have their tool set they have the kubernetes platform they have the GitHub, but they haven't changed their culture so even if you if you have all these uh, platform or the the technologies if your release cycle is at twice a year you can't get the advantage of cloud native platform so we need to change the culture. We need to do the frequent releases and uh, get the early feedback uh, uh, and uh, continuously do uh, uh, this improvement. So uh, a few uh, reference uh, uh, articles so you can read out. Uh, yeah, I think we can go to the question. Yes, thank you, Shiru and Lakmal, for a very informative and, and full covering session on, on cloud native and cloud native architectures. You've said a lot of things already. Uh, and uh, we have about 15 minutes left of this uh, of the time set aside for this webinar. Um, you have said a lot of things, but I thought maybe we should start this sort of panel session, panel discussion with trying to summarize what has been said over the past uh, hour or so. So if I ask you, Shiru and Lakmal, what, what would you say are the three 
top gains or benefits of implementing a, and working with a cloud native architecture? Can I take that, Shiro? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I. Uh, so there are so many benefits uh, that you can get uh, by implementing uh, cloud native architect architectures. Uh, out of the, all these benefits, uh, the top three that come into my mind uh, are like scalability, uh, resilience, uh, and agility. The cloud native architectures are like designed to scale. Uh, like small services like microservices can be deployed as a lightweight containers and they can scale fast along with the traffic or the load of the system. And the decomposing a complex problem uh, uh, into a set of uh, smaller problems uh, will be easier to tackle and fast to develop. Uh, uh, so uh, this provides more resilience and agility to innovate fast and uh, push releases frequently into the production. Would you like to add anything, Shiro? Um, no, I think Lakmal mentioned like the main three things, so yeah. yeah. Okay, and then talking about the WS2 platform in particular, uh, you mentioned Lakmal in your presentation, also Shiro, I think uh, a few of the, the products that you uh, deliver or that you uh, can, can deliver. Um, which are the key benefits you would say that the WC2 product platform can bring to a cloud native architecture compared to other platforms on the market or maybe the competition? What would be the key differentiators, do you think? Okay, so um, I think I'll take that. So, um, so when we were talking about the reference architecture, uh, we mentioned that uh, there are like from a technology point of view, there are two main groups that needs to be in that reference architecture, the API-led integration uh, technology components and then the cloud native uh, technology components. So uh, WSO2 and then WSO2's competitors also have the, the API-led integration components. So there we are on par, but I think where we uh, where we have an advantage is that uh, our uh, we have built in some of those cloud native technologies into some of the tooling that we have on the uh, products, the API manager, for example, the Kubernetes uh, controller uh, that uh, Lakmal spoke about when he was uh, talking about the implementation of the reference architecture. So. The, the main challenge that organizations face is that you basically uh, need people who understand all of these cloud native technologies who can pick what is required and all of that. But what we have done is we have abstracted out that we have picked this technology, we have abstracted it out so that it could be easily used uh, and you, from an organization point of view, you won't be spending a lot of time learning these technologies and figuring out how to uh, put it into place and all of that. So we have done all of that for you. Uh, and because of that, uh, with the w technology, you can basically get up to speed much faster. Okay, thank you. All right, there seems to be a lot of different benefits with cloud native architectures uh, and then you can certainly be more agile and that kind of stuff. Then, but what is stopping everyone then from implementation of this architecture and, and how do you overcome that, that challenge? Yeah, uh, so I think, uh, uh, so main challenge is the culture change. So like I said, uh, so we need to, uh, change our mindset, okay, uh, what are the different things we have to do to uh, get a, a full benefit out of this cloud native architectures? Like uh, to do the frequent releases, like I said, if you, if you do the two releases per year, definitely you can't get uh, advantage while over moving to the cloud native. And then I, I think next challenge is the mindset to accept that new technologies. So we need to learn new technologies. 
so uh, like uh, every day this cloud native domain is uh, like uh, uh, changing uh, or evolving evol- evolving the new uh, new technology space so we need to accept that okay this is like a continuous uh, learning curve so we have to learn continuously and uh, adopt uh, these technologies uh, so these are the mindset changes so uh, uh, in my opinion so the main challenge is the mindset if you have a correct culture and mindset uh to uh use this technology and use uh, different patterns or practices in your organization we can easily uh, uh, uh overcome these challenges okay so culture is basically the main sort of uh, thing keeping thing keeping people uh from from gaining the benefits of of a cloud native architecture good thank you uh, and in my mind, or in, uh, I think I'm safe to say that in many uh, many's mind, uh, the, the general notion is that tech trends often start off in North America and then they spread over the globe. I don't know if this is still true, but it would be interesting to have your view, Alakmal and, and Shiru, since you are based on different continents. I know that you, Alakmal, is based in the US and Shiru, you're based out of Sri Lanka. To have an estimate or guesstimate maybe into how many of the percentages of applications in North America, Europe, uh, EMEA and, and Asia is built cloud native today? What would be your guesstimate, Lakmal, like, in regards of uh, or looking into North America? Yeah, so uh, I think we have seen this in the past, like uh, so some technologies start from the North America and then uh, uh, other regions uh, has uh, follow and uh, adapted. But I think uh, the, uh, if you look at the current uh, trend, uh, I think this gap is very uh, minimum now. So I would say there's no gap uh, at the moment. So we can, I can say that uh, even the uh, EMEA region or APAC, uh, uh, like uh, uh, customers are using or customers are want to move into the cloud. Uh, so I would say uh, there, there is no gap at the moment uh, because of the, the how uh, we, uh, the customers, our, our customers are working. Uh, I don't have a percentage, but in my opinion, I think it's a global thing now. Everyone want to uh, move into the cloud to get out of the, all these benefits. And I think just to add to that, so um, like if someone from any continent is um, maybe getting on this journey a bit late, um, maybe they're at an advantage because they don't need to go through what some of the people who started this journey earlier had to go through like try out things on their own uh, figure things out maybe uh, use something then throw it away use something else and so on so they they can basically follow what people have done and uh, follow maybe the correct things that needs to be done and also make use of uh, abstracted technology that is out there which helps them to get to the place where people who already started are now much faster. Good, thank you. Uh, well, lastly then, I think because time is, is approaching to an end, uh, security and data protection is a concern of, of uh, many organizations when going cloud native. Uh, you, Shiru, I think uh, showed a way to address this with the hybrid environment. Is that the best way you think to address those kind of issues? So, um, so yes. So, so one way to do that is like if you uh, uh, if you have to comply to certain data regulations and so on, then the components that basically handle that data uh, and closer to the systems of record they can be on-prem and then the rest of the architecture can be on the cloud where this doesn't uh, really touch that data. But I think um, if you look at the public cloud vendors out there today, like uh, Amazon, Azure and so on, uh, if you, these basically also do provide uh, uh, some sort of, uh, up, I would say, some level of security and so on. So, uh, and if you uh, basically want to build a platform with a vendor, uh, then basically that vendor, so we, if, if we take our story, we basically, if 
if some customer comes to us and say we would like to use your technology on on a cloud platform but we also have these uh, regulations that we need to comply with so if you're going to the public cloud um, today the the reach is um, much more larger than it was and uh, for the continent data problems, we can probably figure out a data center which could be. And then from the other uh, aspects like compliance, so some of this would be supported by that uh, infrastructure provider themselves. And the remainder could be uh, basically baked into that platform that we built for a, that enterprise. Uh, by uh, putting on like uh, putting in the proper configurations that needs to go in uh, and so on so and uh, also together with some of the features that uh, we needed like for example for gdpr compliance we have some features in our products today that uh, helps people to adhere to that Okay, thank you, Shirul. And we have a couple of minutes left, and we do have an, a couple of open questions also in the Q&A. So maybe I can bring a few of those up uh, in this forum here. The last one I got was uh, from Mohammad. Do you see any performance-based difference or limitations in using Kubernetes cluster as, as in, uh, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service like in Azure? If I read it too fast for you, and like Mal, it's also in the Q&A. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's basically, as, as, if, you, if you're thinking about the answer, I can repeat the question. So it, the question was, do you see any performance-based difference okay. or limitations in using Kubernetes cluster as IAS or PAS, like in Azure? Uh, I would say no. Uh, like, uh, so uh, like uh, if you look at the, the container technology, like uh, the, if you compare the VM, so yeah, we, can, we are running on top of VM, but when you allocate particular uh, CPU uh, or the memory, uh, so with the container technologies, so this CPU and the memory will fully utilize for the application. So it's not like uh, when you are allocating to the VM, so VM will get the, uh, the, some uh, CPU and memory allocation to the operating system and the uh, other uh, component. But uh, when you come to the allocation, if you allocate some something into the like a container world, it will get to the application. So in that sense, I think uh, we can easily uh, uh, match how, how, how much of resources we need. Uh, and uh, so then it is easy to us to uh, estimate, okay, what, what should be the, our cluster size? Uh, so I would say it's more accurate compared uh, if you're using Kubernetes and uh, this container-based platform in your deployment. We have another Kubernetes related question. That is, can we put micro gateway slash monolith gateway in front of Kubernetes certificate manager to identify the client and also do uh, uh, role based access control as well? Uh, so at the moment, like, uh, so we haven't done that, uh, but uh, so normally uh, the role-based access control is happening from the key manager, and uh, uh, this is how this is where we have to figure it out how we can integrate the the, the key manager into the the community's role-based uh, access control. Uh, uh, to uh, to answer that, we haven't done that, but I would say uh, we should do that. Uh, we can do that because it's a uh, it's how how you manage the access control using the role-based thing. Okay. Thank you, Lakmal. And thank you, Shiru. I think uh, our time is up now for this webinar. We set aside one hour and a half and we've reached that point. So with, with this, I would like to thank you, Shiru and Lakmal, for, for your presentations and all the information you have provided to us here. I hope that all participants have enjoyed the content of this webinar. And I would like to thank all the participants also for taking part. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me or any of my colleagues at Red Pro. Or you can also reach out to Hasini or Amal at WSO2 if you have any further questions. Uh, Red Pill Impro and WSO2 will host another event, another webinar in May uh, re uh, regarding the issue of identity and access management. So feel free to sign up for that. And more information about this will be available both on the redpillimpro.com website and at the WSO2 website. 
So with that said, thanks for now and take care, everybody.